Hello. Welcome, everybody. We're just, um, uh, there are a few more people coming in. So bear with us for a moment while we manage the, uh, the waiting room and then we will, we will get going. Greetings to Rafa, who's joined. Where Every are you? Time. Where are you, Rafa? Are you at home? Yeah, I'm okay. Good. Great That's to good. see you again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very happy to, to be in this, my first Friday. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. good. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm very you, curious. You have a very big beard since I saw you last. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we'll get started and we'll let people, more people in as they come. Uh, I'm Richard Favall and we, we have a slightly odd setup here because uh, we have a big screen kind of over there. So you might find people who are here looking the wrong way rather than looking okay. at the screen. But uh, I just want to welcome everybody to this first Friday, which is a special one um, because we are, uh, it's essentially a takeover by uh, the MA Arts and Place students at the new All Shiny, All, all Bright um, art, art School at Dartington. Um, the students who, some of the students who are presenting today have been here at Dartington uh, for two weeks. Um, and then I'm sure they will talk about that. And then we'll, we'll also welcome some input from the other arts and play students who've been elsewhere on a different residency. Joe, I don't know if you want to just say hello and, and say anything very briefly about the course. Sorry, just unmuting. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, it's really nice to be here at First Friday. I haven't been to First Friday either. Oh. So kind of looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, as Richard said, he's kindly um, allowed the MA Arts and Place students to take over this session. Um, so MA Arts and Place is one of the new um, post, um, new MA courses at Dartington Art School. It's the inaugural year. So um, students began in April this year. Um, and the course offers a residency based learning program. So residencies being quite a significant part of the contemporary arts industry now. And so students only spend um, six weeks at Dartington before they go off on residencies all over the UK. Um, and some of the students have been with Art.Earth over the last two weeks um, in Devon. And some students have been up at Outlandia in the Highlands of Scotland. And so hopefully you will enjoy um, share their, what they're sharing with you today, their experiences from both of those residencies. Great, thanks Jo. Um, I'm going to uh, invite Ali to come in first. there. Ali, are you with us? She was. No? I think we might have lost her. Oh dear. Okay. I'm sure she will be. She's, she's there. She's there. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. Hi, Ali. You're back. Okay. Okay. Ali, we're just about to, uh, I was just about to introduce you and then you disappeared, but you're back. So um, would you like to uh, tell us what's been going on at Outlandia? You, um, I also need to uh, give you permission to share again, so bear with me. Yeah, th thank you, Richard. And apologies for that. My internet dropped out at an, an opportune moment. I'm not sure, hopefully it's going to remain for the rest of of um of this uh, this talk just now so um am i okay just to to screen share just now yeah you should be fine and i'll tell you a little bit about what's been going on up here so my name is ali berardelli i'm the um i'm a student on the ME arts and place at dartington art school and um i live in fort william in the highlands of scotland and i'm an artist and 
Um, I have worked at Outlandia, the artist treehouse based in Glen Nevis before on previous projects. And this time I was really happy to welcome two fellow students, Cad and Branwyn, uh, to the area along with Joel Jolson, who's our course leader um, and her family as, and have a really good experience at Outlandia. So I'm just going to share my screen. and hope that everything is going to work. So, and can everybody see that okay? Yeah, yeah. Great, great. So uh, the module we've been working on is Contemporary Remote. It's module three of our, of our ME. And um, there's been two, two different, well, as you know, two different uh, residencies happening um, simultaneously. And this one for the three of us was at Outlandia in Glen Nevis. So this is the, the tree house that was designed by London Fieldworks in 2006, 2007, and built subsequently. So it's been in existence in our remote community for, for quite a number of years, which has been fantastic. I'm going to show you first, I have a uh, work by CAD, and I've got my own project work to show you as well. So I'll just start with CADS and I'll just kick off from here. I think it's just audio this piece <laughs> I'll cut and I'll, there's two like this so I'll shorten them but I'll carry on just now I hate people who talk about remote remote from where I was surprised that there were so many mountains. Very surprised. It has to do with almost never, never land. That is, they're investing in the idea of Scotland. Scotland has become the repository of these dreams, land of dreams. What they're buying is a kind of image. The concept of Scotland becomes a kind of repository of feelings and emotions and places and the world we had that's to do with landscapes, it's to do with castles. Landscape is imagined, it's part of the imagination. So that's uh, Kadir Kadababa's work. And um, I think he's been looking mostly at um, the vision of Scotland from out with the area and things that might be imagined about the place. And he's been making a little bit of film, a little bit of sound recording, and also beginning to explore printmaking and different uh, types of printmaking up at Outlandia and also 
um, alongside me using cyanotype technique, which is what I'm going to talk about just now. So this is my own project, um, Surface Tension, where I've been looking at uh, different aspects of, of my connection to place, a uh, connection to Glen Nevis, um, very much part of my upbringing, uh, visiting the Glen, and trying to link it back with some of the cultural references that we have from around this area as well, alongside some um, tensions to do with biodiversity and growth and particularly forests in the Glen. There's just a, a couple of images here to show you Outlandia as we arrived there and some participation uh, elements I've had within my own work where I've invited uh, children and young people who were part of a group that we took up to Glen Nevis to yeah. explore the, what they imagined to be the surface underneath the tension um, with drawing and making cyanotype prints. And this is printing the work with the participants uh, at the River Nevis, which has been a really nice experience to do out in the wilds and to, to really experience the UV light um, reacting quickly with the, with the drawn images. Um, an aspect of my project which I felt was important was my relationship to place as I've explained and also thinking about female voices in history which are not so apparent within this area in particular, any of the research I do. So, I've decided to put some female voices into my project and these are my friends. Um, so I had a visit to Outlandia with my friends and I spent an evening, a very enjoyable evening, uh, photographing, filming and documenting and then trans transcribing our conversations. But it was all to do with this reference. I'm just gonna play a very short clip here. Hopefully it's going to work. <laughs> So that last slide is uh, an old Gaelic bard talking about, or recorded in the 1950s, talking about an ancient story of shooting a deer in a hillside in Glen Nevis. And it just really, it gave me lots of ideas of how we, what we take from place and what we leave. And it also encouraged a little bit of conversation with my friends about how we feel about Glen Nevis, what we feel about the amount of visitors we have coming, how we feel about being local to that place and actually having to kind of give it up almost at certain times of the year. Um, I'd also have been referencing two different sides of the Glen. We've got one side deciduous native woodland, one side's forest. So I've written a little uh, conversation between two trees from either side of the Glen and that's just informed some of the work as well. And it's all, um, become a, a large cyanotype print, which I've been working on. Um, uh, lots of different elements combined, drawn work, written work. Um, this is a process just to show you briefly. That's the size of the print that I've made. Unfortunately, I printed it this morning and there wasn't quite enough UV in the sky, but the idea is there. And I've used, I've referenced Outlandia, that's the exploded form or really the diagrammatic drawing of Outlandia. Um, and trying to reference some of the architectural design and the blueprints of, of days gone by. Some Gaelic included there and also some of the, the um, position, the place of Outlandia, vanish restriction name, that comes from an app called uh, Three Words and it's to do with anywhere in the world has three words of that place within the three metre square. So that is Outlandia's three words and again uh, using the Gaelic there too. And these are the prints that have um, come out today. So it's, a, it's been a really enjoyable project for me. And I think I can stop sharing now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That's great. We will uh, just have a couple of um, 
minutes for if anybody has a uh, question I would, I would like to ask about a bit, bit of time at the end as well but if anyone would like to ask Ali a question we're not quite in our usual sort of setup here so I'm not really able to monitor the chat but if anybody would uh, like to come in and uh, ask a question Ali, a question from me, Mary. Um, just a, a, a little bit about your practice before the residency. Were you uh, were you working in this way? Were you using cyanotypes? Uh, just would be interested to have a sentence or two about how what you've done relates to what you have done. Yeah, no, of course. No, I have. Yes, I've been working with cyanotype for a number of years now, um, really experimenting the process. And my background's in illustration and design, so it really it it kind of follows sits, doesn't it? Yeah. Path. And uh, yeah, and it works for me because I really enjoy working with collage, and this is a way to um, really articulate that. But uh, and I love playing with the scale as well, and I love the fact that it's in a natural light. So yes, yeah, so I have been doing quite a bit with with that process in the past. Thank you. Thanks. Helpful. Great. I think, um, given the time, we're going to go on to Chris. Just, just, just talk and be on the screen. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all in this context. My name's Chris. I'm a student from Watson Place. Um, I'm just going to get straight into it. So, uh, I'm just going to share. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, so I'm hoping um, you can all see this. Uh, so the residency for me, um, it started with what felt like a simple premise. Um, the title here, Fair Swap, and the objective was to investigate and depict transactions that we make um, within the landscape and how it relates to this theme of contemporary remote. Um, and so my first thought was to put whimsical images um, of objects within the landscape um, to place them sort of incongruously and then use these to open up wider conversations that we have about our relationship uh, with the land and the resources that we take from it. And Sorry, um, it became clear really, really quickly uh, that the subject matter is, is vast. And once I start to investigate the scope, it widened incredibly quickly. Um, and it had the potential to become quite overwhelming in a short space of time. So my interest was piqued by a walk through Yarna Wood. Uh, now Yarna is a local woodland, it's a designated site of special scientific interest. It's a small 350 acre woodland, um, relatively unspoilt ancient woodland, much as Dartmoor would have had uh, before farming practices took most of the woodland away. Um, and Yarn is also the site of a copper mine that was active in the latter part of the 19th century. So Dartmoor is an industrious landscape and from the macro to the micro, um, sitting down, watching the ants living sort of harmoniously within this landscape, they take what they need to survive as a vast forest community and they return the service with the sea dispersal and pest management and nutrient recycling and they're a food source uh, for larger woodland omnivores and carnivores and I wanted to investigate our own relationship with the landscapes is as harmonious as uh, that of the ants so uh, mining and evidence of mining and quarrying is everywhere in and around Dartmoor so there's tinner's huts and there's long abandoned copper mines and there's huge ball claim um, quarries uh, in the Bobby Basin. So we can't escape these current and present impacts on the landscape. Now, many of us locally, I suspect, are aware of the clay quarrying works that are evident around Newton Abbott and King Stainton, but perhaps they're not aware. Um, 
as indeed I was, and with the Bobby Basin and the works there, visible miles around and indeed from space, um, are critically important in the production of certain ceramics. They have an illustrious history. Uh, they've been used as a source of clay for Wedgwood pottery in the 18th century. And this resource, ball clay, is so scarce, um, in fact, that a significant percentage of the world's use of this clay actually comes uh, from here in the Bobby Basin. And it's in all the things that we'd expect, uh, bathroom ceramics, toilets, basins, um, Due to its plasticity, it lends itself to various polymer production and other industrial use, and it has low conductivity, both of heat and electricity. So it's used as insulators and isolators and electronics and as such, and has even traveled into space. Um, I'll share with you a short bit of writing that this inspired. So more than a hole in the ground, what is here reaches far around the earth and into space. From where these deep chasms in the landscape can be seen, great scars protected to be dug deeper, further for what is here cannot be found there, or there, or there, or there. Just here in Devon and a little elsewhere. <laughs> Drawn from the flows through the granite rocks of Dartmoor through hundreds of thousands of years, kaolite washed, refined and deposited Bobby Basin's deep seams brought forth the yield, thrown into shapes familiar and bright in every bathroom shining white, so familiar as to be invisible, like a hole in the ground surrounded by trees, what becomes places like these. And so I'll add that I mentioned these scars protected. Um, and it's true that these quarries around Newton Abbott and King Stainton, they exist under something called protected mineral rights. Um, and this has caused quite a lot of contention over the years. Locally, Civil Co, who own these mineral rights, have contested and taken to judicial review. Uh, proposals to widen local roads, proposals to build a mini new town west of Newton Abbott, and all of these proposals, Civil Co, have felt put at risk to ball clay deposits and the potential of future quarrying. And the wind, as such, blows in Civil Co's favour. And the National Planning Policy Framework advises that great weight should be given to mineral extraction and the permission should not normally be granted for non-mineral development where that would sterilize reserves um, but i digress time like in this residency is short and civil co an international company based in belgium are not immediately the easiest people to open a open up a conversation with so my desire to enter a quarry and take photographs and to bring something into this scarred landscape and take something out um, I was very keen to, but not having the means to buy thousands of tonnes of clay or sand meant I wasn't a prior priority conversation for Civil Co. So these quarries, they're just one aspect of our relationship with the landscape. And where does it sit within the idea of contemporary remote? Well, for me, it's this amorphous definition of remote that we're allowed to play with. Is anywhere remote nowadays? When given enough money, anyone can get anywhere, even potentially the moon within 24 hours, given the current direction of travel. Maybe remoteness is our collective engagement with the landscape, the general lack of care and lackadaisical approach to land and resources that have landed us in this time of climactic environmental emergency, where rains fall with greater intensity and the sun burns hotter than it ever has before. Who cares? Perhaps it's the connection to the land that's remote, any land and not any particular location at all. I start to become overwhelmed with the task that I potentially set myself. And as a daily walker, pounding through the woods or across the moor, I started to try and find another strand for exploration. So fortunately, Joe had recently brought to my attention uh, the artist Marie Yates, and I was excited to see that she had worked early in her career set in Henbury Woods, a place close to my heart and where I walk nearly every day. It was time to stop obsessing over the vast industri industrious actions of the Newton Abbott quarries and focus on something else. So Henbury Woods, like Yarna, is a small piece of managed woodland just on the outskirts of Buckfast and Buckfast Lee on the edge of Dartmoor. And I was already aware of a story about another Marie with another potential local connection. And I started to wonder if I could link the two in some way. So Marie Yates' works, work in a little known Devonshire woodland was evocative but for me, clearly, the location of the photograph, somewhere that I walk and swim and sit and socialise as such, 
resonated deeply. And I felt that before I did anything else, I had to pay homage to it in some way. So the other Marie uh, is Marie Curie. And the story that I'd heard was that deep into the Kingswood, another local woodland, the woodland managed for timber with great pines reaching into the sky, there's an addict to a mine from which a substance called pitch blend was mined towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Now, pitch blend, which is called uraninite, was a radioactive uranium rich black ore. And the story goes was a source of uranium for Marie Curie, who was, of course, integral to the development of X ray and mobile X ray technology. I desired a Geiger counter to explore the woods for myself as safely as possible, deeply curious as to the radioactive content of the streams from which I and the dog regularly drank. But more so, with a background in radio and sound, I had the idea to take something from both Marie's to make something new and envisage recording of a piece composed and made in the woods for bull roarer and Geiger counter. And alas, though it felt close, the Geiger count had never materialised, although I did have some interesting email conversations with a surveyor for Hinkley Point Power Station. And sadly, he laid to rest the story of Kingswood and Marie Curie's uranium. For those, indeed, uranium is found in Kingswood, and in certain locations, the radiation levels are highly significant, and within the mine entrance, more significant and potentially hazardous still. It is almost certain that the ore used by Curie came from Cornwall and not Devon, and the story had arisen due to conflation of the mines, both having been owned and operated by the same company and extractions from both being listed under the same title. The Cornwall mines having far larger seams are by far the most likely subsequent source of Curie's uranium. That, however, did not stop me from pursuing the composition and with my trusty companion, I set to scouring the woods of Henbury to find the perfect piece of wood with which to recreate a bull roarer as Marie, as Marie Yates would have done. Not having a saw, not wishing to be too conspicuous, however, and feeling very conscious that I didn't want to take too much, ideally hardly anything from the woods themselves. The perfect bit of wood in this case was that which was lying around and would fit conveniently and snugly into my rucksack. So, As I'm short on time, I'll keep on talking while this plays. Um, I haven't really talked much about walking. There was the intention to make walking uh, a core part of this residency, and to some extent it has been. Bubbling under the process was the idea that these transactions should be reflected through walks between landscapes to connect with objects in landscape and bear the burden of these objects physically, like the ants in Yana, as they carry through the landscape from one to another and document these journeys as well as the conclusions. The realization of this task is almost mythical, the distances involved having the potential to be anything from a matter of miles to many thousands of miles. Never say never, but the impossibility of some of the potential journeys is part of the appeal. Um, and at this point, uh, I guess I'll conclude and let the video run out. I've really enjoyed this residency. It's encouraged new ways of thinking about landscape and ways to work within it that I'll take forward. Uh, I want to thank Richard and Manu um, and Art Earth for their care and their hospitality um, and their wisdom. Um, when the video finishes, I'll just show you the results. <laughs> uh, my construction. <laughs> Maybe we could go and wave it around outside later. Um, I think you get the gist, so I'll stop sharing. It's kind of short.
<laughs> this is my trusty companion, by the way. Oh, I can't stop sharing. I'll tell you what, I'll let it finish. <laughs> yeah. Shows your ball. Oh, go on, Ed. Here we go. Um, that was the first one. Tune from the wood in Henbury. Um, this is number two. So, a ball roar is, um, I guess it relates to my interest in radio and communication. So, it's just a means of making a noise by waving a bit of wood around on a bit of string, which I'm not going to do here with much enthusiasm. Um, and it creates a low drone and it, it would have been used for sig signaling. Um, and historically, they've found all around the world um, within indigenous communities in the UK and Australia and uh, in the Americas. They're an international form of communication, I guess. Um, and yes, the, what I wanted to do was uh, play these along with the Geiger counter in the woods, but that opportunity hasn't um, presented itself yet. But who knows? Anyway, uh, that's me done, I think. Thank you for listening. Hello. I'm hello. just going to get... Hello, everybody. Hello. So I'm Sam, um, and well, we're all here on our 10th day of residency here on the Dartington Estate at High Cross House, um, which was kindly facilitated by Art.Earth. And um they've looked after us extremely well um our task was to consider the concept of remote um and yeah can you see that remote yeah yeah so uh, literal sort of like responses to remote there's a landscape so one looking fell over to the other one saying no person detected on a mobile screen can you see that yeah yes. yeah thank you and um, the next one is a remote view of a shop and bend so just a landscape and then uh bubbles going off into the remote into the distance okay um, okay so you get the idea and then here's a charcoal and chalk drawing um looking over um uh, the sunken guard the tilt yard and then that's the sort of pinhole camera effect looking back over by the solar farm so just ideas that um got developed so as i was explaining my frustration um, Minu came up with a really good strategy. Uh, she simply said, look, honour the ideas that you come up with. There might be just scratches in the sketch, but, but, but take them further. Just, just, um, just develop them, just acknowledge them uh, by, by actually realising them through drawing. So I used my drawing practice and that helped. But then I started getting fussy about that and thinking about the outcome. And um, this was helped by discovering a very big blackboard at High Cross House. And uh, this loosened me up a bit because the nature of chalk and charcoal, chalk and charcoal, <laughs> sorry, but right, I'm going to calm down, um, is that you can't be too precious. It's, it's temporary, you can move it around. And it was a very, it's a big blackboard. So really nice to work physically. Just to consider this concept of scale and distance um, perspective. So here we go. This is uh, Julie obliging the immersal into the dart, aided by my friend and colleague Tegan. <laughs> Apologies for the sound. Okay. 
Nanti lanjut. Um, and so I rigged up, I rigged up a, a mobile phone on that foam yoga brick, and I floated on my back, looking at the sky and the trees, um, and just being immersed in it. And just being a, and just allowing myself to drift along. Now I come from London, and I was really looking forward to being remote. Really, really wanted to immerse myself in it. And um, the weird thing that happened was that this drive, this real wish to want to be alone, to experience solitude from being locked down. Um, the more I explored, the more I felt a sense of, oh, I don't know, uncomfortableness, disorientation. And so then my work shifted a bit um, and I started, the more I felt sort of disoriented, the more I wanted to find a fixed point, the more I wanted to actually locate myself and became more and more important to, to know where I was in relation to, to place and, and to people. So um, I'm just gonna, I did a responsive drawing to that. So just a very quick response. So I realized, um, I was given the opportunity to realize that pattern of my process as I attempt to come up with work for a residency is that I proliferate with, with ideas that don't ever get finished. So I was determined to complete a work. So one part of my mission was to explore the, the length of the river dock from source to sea. So my next mission was to go and find the head of the river dock, which is uh, the, the west dock head. So in the northern kind of remoteness of Dartmoor, I headed off uh, on Wednesday. Uh, not very well prepared. I didn't want to fork out 15 quid for a compass, which is very, very silly. Uh, so I had to take bearings using my iPhone cable. I did remember to bring a charger, um, three ginger nuts, a banana, an apple, um, and a waterproof. And here's an example of just how few landmarks there are to get sort of fixes on, to get bearings on. <laughs> yeah. There are no people at all. <laughs> um, so there we go. The love hate relationship continued. Um, just two okay, two minutes. Um, so I, uh, I then c continued, despite finding the terrain really, really quite hard and losing direction quite a lot. So here I am, uh, I think 800 metres away. Apologies <laughs> for the sound. The, in the distance, you can just see the, the edge of the firing range, which I knew it was a marker to say I was back. <laughs> oh, that's Lizzie, my daughter, feeling remote from her. So just really wanted to check in. In case that was the last sort of message I sent. <laughs> or I got lost in a bog. <laughs> anyway, I'm a bit closer here. Um,
They're going slightly mad, tiredness. And, oh, before I run this, I got to the head. I arrived, there was nothing there, absolutely nothing. Just lots of grass, lots of sky, few lumps of granite, and just really, really tiny me. And no big arrow pointing to where this head was. So I took a lovely sort of panoramic video just to prove I was there. I took my coordinates. And and then I kind of plodded on. I'd, I'd, I'd seen it through, but just, it, it wasn't until I heard something. So this is what the next. Okay, so maybe I couldn't hear it. I mean, maybe I didn't see it, but I found it. I found the head. What claim? Sorry. Um, this is the head of the dog. It's probably not out of the ground. It's really loud. You, you can't see it. So on there, there's a picture of a telegraph pole because I make my way back. And it's a sign of for sort of civilization. I kind of, yes, that, you know, I'm going to make it back again. Um, like I say, this kind of love-hate relationship. I'm interested. I'm interested if that's a common human experience. That we have a bit of a push-pull, a bit of a love-hate relationship with remoteness. And that's just a bigger picture of where I got to. Thank you very much for listening. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. So cool. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, we're having a few technical challenges today, but we'll get there in a moment. Okay, so uh, Tegan, over to you. We'll just lo load up your. Uh... There it is. And when you're ready, you can share the screen. I keep losing the mouse. Hello, um, I'm Tegan. I'm on the Arts and Play course as well. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Share the desktop. Oh. We'll just try it. Too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Yeah, so I'm studying on the Arts and Place course part time. So I've only done the first six weeks at Dartington, and then I had six weeks off, and then followed by this residency, which has been really lovely because I was at the first, the first time we were at Dartington it all felt really rushed and the weather was really miserable and we were all just sort of trying to settle ourselves into 
you know, having lessons again and learning and trying to make loads of work. Um, so we really just used the six weeks to find our place at Dartington. Um, my process is going out and collecting lots of plants and lots of pigments. And then I bring them back to the studio and I will do natural dyeing or making inks and paint with them. Um, so yeah, this is just like a visual patchwork that I made of my time at Dartington during the first, the first module. So it's lots of small drawings and pictures and then clips of me from when I was dying and pigment and monoprints and stuff. Um, yeah, so this second residency, being back at Dartington has been really lovely because it's sort of given us a bit of time to explore around Dartington without just being sort of stuck on the estate, which has been really nice. Um, so this time I wanted to look at Dartmoor um, and initially I started to look backwards and looking at the history of Dartmoor and where it's come from but then quickly I sort of realised that maybe it's actually more helpful if I look forward and create, um, I'm trying to create projects that I can revisit so they're sort of, you know, they have longevity. So I started by asking people on various Facebook groups and emailing lots of different people that work on Dartmoor to ask them where they think Dartmoor will be in 10 years. What will the ground feel like? What will it smell like? What animals will be there? What plants will be there? And um, so I started to get some really lovely responses. They were all different. There were lots of people that were kind of pessimistic about it and I had one man who said that it will probably just be an island with only sheep living on it and then other people that said that it will be full of rowan trees and loads of lovely animals so it was really nice to get lots of different opinions from people who obviously spend a lot of time on the moor. Um, so then I spent a day out on Dartmoor, I went to Shipley Bridge and then I walked up and around the moor and I took my metre square with me as a way of sort of mapping out what plants I could see. Um, and then I brought them back, these pictures, and um, made these sort of visual diagrams of what was around. So I'm hoping that when I revisit again in 10 years time, I can go back to these spots, I've saved the coordinates and see what's actually growing there. So it would be a really nice sort of comparison to be able to make. Um, so that was one with bracken of fern. And then this is Tormund Hill, which I didn't realise until afterwards and I came back and um, identified these little tiny yellow flowers, but you can actually dig up the roots to make a really lovely dark red dye. So I'm disappointed that I never actually dug up the roots, I just picked the flowers because that would have been really nice. I think there's a bit of a delay on this, isn't there? There we go. Um, yeah, so I just spent my time on Dartmoor going around and collecting lots of samples. So this is the soil from um, a spot near Shipley Bridge and then it's just sort of bringing it all back to the studio to work out how I can use these and how I can involve them in my, in my practice. So, um, so I brought back the plants that I picked. So I picked lots of gorse and lots of bracken and I brought them back and I started dyeing with them. So um, I put all these lovely different colors on different papers. So I'm hoping that like my visual sort of patchwork that I made during the first residency that I can bring these back and make another one that sort of sums up what dark was like in 2021. Um, yeah so then eventually I've just started putting together this small booklet. Um, this I've only got my first page here to show you but it's going to be a collection of all of the different quotes that I've gathered from people 
and then also sort of my field notes and my finished pieces when I actually get to finish them off next week and then I'm going to have it printed and it will be hopefully then will be available for mm -hmm. work yeah um so it'll be really nice and then hopefully again in 2031 I can go back and make another one and then just repeat it every 10 years to see how Dartmoor's changed and you know what people have envisioned which ones have actually come true and yeah I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll stop sharing. We have a few minutes left. Um, so, um, would anybody like to um, ask a question of any of the presenters here today? Mm. Yes, Richard. Yes, Rafa. Yes. Well, I enjoyed uh, all four presentations. They're really great. Uh, I'm astonished uh, about the, how much work uh, you put in your exploration, which is the main, for me, the main um, the core of, of your work, the exploration of the landscape, which is, uh, in, in, in these times, um, ever changing. We are in a, in a, in an era of, of uh, when exploration is quite necessary because of the, the 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 speed of changes we we face everywhere. So for an artist, I'm, I'm very proud of of uh, people like you choosing um, exploration as a as a main tool. You know? That's the first, my first comment, and. Um, what I can see in, in all of the four um, artists, uh, the output of, uh, of, of that exploration is quite different, but mainly I, I can see uh, um, a connection which has to do with memory. You are exploring and making art for what in the future will be memory. I can see in the in the four of you, so that's quite interesting for me, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to see artists working in that way. It's, it's, it's very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nasser. Yeah, some uh, Chris, uh, for instance, working with after explorations, finishing in in in, in his. Um, Hand, handmade tools, handwork, uh, it's fascinating. So, uh, Sam, you've, uh, it's, a, it's a, a good way of, of exploring to lose yourself and then get the, the right way at, at the end. Huh? So all, all your memories uh, inside you to express them. Uh, the same with Ali, with um, with the recollection of stories. Also, this is very important. Mm -hmm. the, the contact with people uh, and to and to show it in in the world. Of, of course, it's a, um, it's a the, the, your work is 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 in in the process now. But I think that, um, there will be good outputs. And taken is. Um, very, very interesting. The, another aspect of the exploration and, and the, the artist taking some um, uh, science techniques for 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 um, capturing the state of a, of a landscape, and that's have to do very much with memory, which is quite important. So uh, I'm very happy to 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 for you to share that that experience. I think it's. Um, initial, and I don't know how much time you have to, to continue develop this work. And uh, I hope the best uh, yeah, for for your for your work in the, in, in May. Yeah, I like it well, very much. Rafa, thank you very much for that really nice wrap up. Actually, of the the session, um, we are thank running you. slightly over, but we did have a a few uh, hitches there. Did anybody else like to come in with a Question or a comment? Not 
Go ahead. I can unmute. Uh, I can't <laughs> no. Try and unmute yourself, Robin. No. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> um, I think. I'll, <laughs> I think it's good. I'll can I just add something? Yes. Um, just very briefly, just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, for such short residencies and for everyone listening, you know, these are two residencies and I think it's a huge, um, huge ask for students to sort of engage in such, such a short amount of time so spontaneously, but yet so rigorously um, with um, new approaches for their practice. And I just, I just see the confidence in these students growing massively and their practice really evolving and it's just you know, it's wonderful to see. So I'm really happy. I think the, the residencies are being really important um, for this kind of work and getting away from thinking just about the comfort of the studio and, and really engaging with place and the environment and everything it has to offer, negative and positive. So just well done, everybody. I really enjoyed the presentations from all of you. And I think on that note, we'll finish and um, look forward to seeing you again in September. We will put this up on the website. And I'm, you're talking to my, I'm talking, you're seeing my shirt. Uh, we'll put this up on the website. And um, with uh, anybody who'd like to share their email i'll put those up as well and you can contact the artists directly that way so give me a couple of days and we'll get that up and uh thank you very much and we'll see you next time okay. thank you richard Bye -bye. thank you Bye. Bye. Bye.